Richard Paul Evans, New York Times and USA number one best-selling author. Thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. you are the author of 25 best-selling novels. You've got the Christmas box. 36. But 36. Who, but who's <laughs> Incredible. 36 best-selling novels. And, and the collections, the Michael Vay series, the Christmas box, and all of those various things. You, you have become quite a prolific writer. How hard do you work at it? Very. Too, too hard, in fact. I, I don't have much of a life outside of it. And seven years ago, when, when I decided to write three books a year with the Michael Vay series and the Walk series, I'm glad I did it. But it has just about collapsed my brain. <laughs> I am so tired. Tell, tell me, what is a typical writing day for you? Um, typical writing day is trying to fit it in. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a crammer. It's what happens. I, I used to be in advertising, so it was always these deadlines, right? So I usually wait till my e editor yells at me, and then I lock myself away in a hotel room and write for like three days straight, sleeping just a few hours between. And wh what I found is it actually works really well because you go into this kind of psychosis where you're in the book, you're in the story, and you really know the characters. You remember everything they're doing and saying. So it actually works well in this case, unlike final exams in college. Did you always want to be a writer? No, no. Um, when I, was, when I was younger, I had difficulty reading because I have Tourette syndrome and attention deficit. And, um, and so I was always put in the slow reading groups, so books were kind of an enemy. And it wasn't until I found The Hobbit when I was a little bit older and I realized that I could read these books. And I, I immediately started writing, thinking, I can do this. And I think I looked back at some of the stuff was pretty good, actually. And I, I just started doing it, but I never really thought it would be a living. Now, I was, I was writing radio commercials and winning awards and, and brochures and things at an ad agency. Um, but to be a, a professional novelist, you know, that was too big of a dream. For some folks, thinking of being a writer means you've got all day long and nothing to do. All day long except sit and type, you know, when the spirit strikes you. Is it like that for you or are you more structured? I can't, I can't do that. Um, no, I was talking to Mary Higgins Clark, and she told me her routine. Gets up at like 6 o'clock, writes a little bit, and stops for tea, and then she has it right down to the hour. Um, I can't do that. I, just, I have to have a million things going in order for me to write. And it seems like, uh, I, I don't know if I'm a stress junkie or what, but I, I have to have other things going, and that kind of intensifies the writing experience. ADD. Yeah. Talking to you. Now, it is no secret that you have Tourette's. Some folks may not be aware that you have Tourette's syndrome and ADD. Um, how does that, or how did that, inform your decision to become a full-time novelist? It, what it does is, is it, makes, it makes me get bored really fast. And so if you read the reviews like the Chicago Times, or when they'll say he's a, he's a very good but a very austere writer. He doesn't waste words. And, and that's why I hear from Michael Vay, kids say, parents saying, wow, it's the only thing my kid will read. Well, I understand it. Because I don't, if it, I have to read the book 60 times, they only have to read it once. And so I start throwing things out if it bores me at all, or if I feel like it's slowing down at all. So it actually makes me a better writer, but it also sometimes makes it very difficult to actually sit there and do it. Mm. Do your editors have much to do once you're done and you hand the manuscript, manuscript in? Um, not too much. Um, my last editor, I remember I turned in one of the books, she goes, wow, instant book just had water. And she goes, well, I, there's not much to do here. Uh, but I've been doing this. I have my 10,000 hours in, right? I've been doing this for more than 20 years. When I first started, I was learning, and I was clashing with my editor all the time. And, and she was a junior editor, so we were, always, we were fighting over things. No, I wanted to stay, and blah, blah, blah. And then she leaves, and they, they give me the vice president of Simon & Schuster, one of the best editors in the world, someone who's worked with Pulitzer Prize winners, did Hillary Clinton's book. And so the first time we have this disagreement... I go, no, I want to stay, but I'm used to this kind of fight. And she goes, okay. I go, wow. I go, okay. I'm like pushing, and there's nothing to push on. She goes, yeah, it's your book. You're the one that's going to be embarrassed. <laughs> it's like, I go, you think that this will embarrass me? And she goes, yeah, but it's your name on the book. <laughs> and so she was, it was just, it was like this, okay, let's have a collaboration. And she taught me. She was a really tough editor. 
Mm. And um, it was like having this really tough basketball coach, right? And I was with her for 14 years, and then she left to be the head of another publishing house. And the day she left, I, it was really emotional, because when I first met her, I didn't like her, and I was told I wouldn't like her. But the agent who told me that said, you will love her more than anyone else in the industry when you're done. And I did. We were very close. And she said, Rick, it's been an honor to work with one of America's greatest writers. Wow. And I said, you don't believe that. I go, you, you, you don't believe that. You don't think that? She goes, of course I do. You are. And I said, you have said nothing in 14 years that would make <laughs> me believe that. And she said something I'll never forget. She said, it was my job to make you good, not feel good. Wow. So what a great, what a great thing to say. There has to be an element of humility, even for someone at your level. When you are working with a publisher and editor on one of your manuscripts, to what degree do you balance the humility with what you really want in this book? Well, um, I think of like Mark Eaton, who was on your show mm -hmm. too long ago, or Carl Malone. Excellent players, but um, I've, I've had a chance to work with Mark on, on his book. Most coachable man I have ever been with. Mm -hmm. He listens and then he uses his talent, but he listens. And Carl Malone always said, you know, these young guys, they don't listen to their coaches. Um, that's what an editor is, it's a coach. They can't do what I do. And I, every now and then they'll go in and like start writing things and I'll, well, I made the mistake of mocking them once, like this is horrible writing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, they can't write, but they're, it's like they can't, you know, Frank Layden was out there hitting three pointers, but he could tell you exactly why you weren't, weren't making those three-pointers or how to make them. Mm. So that's what it's like. So it does take a level of humility. Um, I approach it with a, a kind of a gratitude. I'm, I'm grateful to work with someone who's very competent, who's been around the block, who has done hundreds and hundreds of books and can give me advice to get a better book because that's what I want. And they can see things that sometimes I'm too close to the book and I don't see it. The Christmas Box was a smash hit when it came out and it spawned a trilogy of stories, and it also spawned a foundation, the Christmas Box House. Tell us the story of, of how that progressed and how you came to the idea of, well, this is much bigger than just a book. Well, it happened when we got our first check. Our first check, um, I'll never forget, I got a check for like, um, I think it was four and a half million dollars. Oh my word. And I, yeah, I, I took pictures of it, right? <laughs> Is this and, real? And, and yeah, and then I went down to Zion's bank and tried to cash it. <laughs> <laughs> in, I, in crisp 20s, in crisp, please. Yeah, it's yeah. like I just yeah. need, and it was so funny the way, that, it's like I walked up and and they kept passing me to different people like, are you crazy? And, and then suddenly someone walked around and said, Mr. Evans, you're in the wrong side of the bank. <laughs> I didn't realize there was another side of the bank. And they were much nicer in the other side of the bank, actually. Oh, wow. Um, but anyway, we, so we had this money, and, and I was raised um, you know, financially struggling our whole life. My, mm -hmm. dad, my dad was a, a social worker who did construction work trying to feed eight kids, you know. And so it was, we never had much. And I was worried. I had kind of this bias against people who had money. And so I was worried. It's like, how is this going to affect my children? So my wife and I talked about it, and we went to a meeting with a financial planner, and he basically told us how to set up trust when our kids are drug addicts, and mm -hmm. we left just freaked out. You know, everything that can go wrong. And I'll never forget, we're in our little minivan, and Carrie turned to me and said, let's give the money back. <laughs> wow, she, she, she was serious. She was serious. I go, hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> Wait, hold on a minute. second. And that's when we decided, let's do something with this money. And that's how it started uh, with the Christmas box house. Um, what we did, we, I asked my dad, who was doing construction work, and his body was failing. I said, Dad, let me hire you. I want you to go find out how we can do the most good in this community for children. And he went to school, because he was a social worker, he went up and talked to KD, uh, the dean of the School of Social Work, and that's what just started everything and, um, rolling. And that was more than 20 years ago now. We've had close to 100,000 children who we've helped. The Christmas box house, foundation and that whole enterprise though almost nosed into the dirt at one point yeah what happened well it was tough um launching something like that is tough and i was pretty much making all the donations i mean we would get here we, here we are building a 1.7 million dollar facility which was already a half million dollars over budget and i'm getting donations for ten dollars fifteen dollars mm. and so i'm i'm fueling this and i'm getting deeper and deeper and deeper and 
and I had two really profound experiences. The first was um, with the board. I came in one day and I, we were having a board meeting. My dad says, I'd like to make a motion. I said, sure, and he goes, I make a motion that we dissolve the board and we dissolve the Christmas box house. I go, what? <laughs> It's like, I'll, it's like, wait a second, wait, you guys have talked about this? Like, and my dad said, you know what, this is bankrupting you. This, is, this isn't what you said you were going to do. This wasn't the agreement we had. No one's helping. There's no momentum. It's like, this is going to kill you, and I just can't watch this. And uh, I said, do you all feel the same way? And they all did. It's like, you want to shut this down. And here we had already, like, put in a foundation. And, and frankly, it's like, I want to shut it down, too. I'm tired. I'm, I, it hurts. I'm, I'm, I've maxed out all my credit lines. I'm, I'm financially in trouble. Uh, and I'm not sure where the next money's coming from. It's like, so I go, just a minute. I walk back into a utility closet and shut the door. And, and I kneel down next to a water heater. And I just said, God, can I stop? May I please stop? And I got a very definite answer. I just, in not a loud voice, just in my head said, if you fail, no one will succeed. Mm -hmm. And I thought, darn, <laughs> it's like I don't get, I don't get to stop. I wanted, I wanted to stop. Yeah. And so I stood up and I walked back out and I said, uh, no, we don't quit. I go, if you, all want, if you want to resign from the board, you can do that. Um, and then one of the, one of the uh, men who was actually the head of primary residential treatment said, it's a sinking ship, Richard. I said, I guess I go down with it. Mm. I go, failure. And so they said, okay. I said, does anyone want to resign? They said, no. I was like, okay, let's get to work. Mm. And uh, it, it didn't get much easier. Um, the next challenge was my wife. I mean, one day I came home. I was stressed. I had just, I had maxed out everything that day. I had gotten a loan for $400,000. Wow. And I made a promise I wouldn't, I wouldn't mortgage the house. That was the one promise I had made her. And... She saw how upset I was, and she was mad. She goes, you spent all of our money on something that no one cares about in Mayfell. So we got in this big fight, and it's like I couldn't argue with her. She was right. Mm -hmm. So um, she goes to her room, and I go down to my cave, right? I'm sitting there, I was like, what do I do? What do I do? And, well, about an hour later, Carrie um, t pages me and says, our son's sick. He has a fever. So I come upstairs, and sure, and sure enough, he has about 101 degree temperature. Well, it starts escalating. Within, within two hours, and now it's, it's like one in the morning, it's 104 degrees and, and it's been rising nonstop. It's like, we've got to get him to the hospital. So we put him in the car, and Michael was 18 months at the time. So we put him in the car and we um, go up to Primary Children's Hospital. And we go in, it's all dark, you know, it's, it's, it's late, it's about two in the morning now. And, and we go in, we sit down, and we're sitting down like against this wall here. And my wife is sitting right here, and I'm sitting here. And while we're sitting there waiting to see a doctor, a social worker walks in carrying a baby, an 18-month-old baby, the same as Michael, who had just been beaten up. Oh. And, and his hair had been yanked out of his head, and there's blood on his head, but there's patches of bald spots all around. And he came in, and it was the strangest thing, because he came and he walked right in front of my wife, holding the baby like this in front of her, while he's talking to the nurse, and she's getting the detail of everything that happened to the baby and what they need to check. My wife, of course, being this wonderful mother, is like, she can't stop crying. She's watching. It's like, oh, my goodness. Someone hurt this child. And I, so after he finished speaking, and he's sitting there for a moment, I go, sir. I said, um, I'm Richard Paul Evans. I go, um, what are you going to do with this baby tonight after you see the doctor? And he goes, well, if we had your shelter that you're working on, he would go there. He goes, as it is, I'll start waking up people and try to find someone to take them. And then he walked away, and my wife is sitting there just crying. She's just sitting like this. She turns to me, she goes, finish the shelter. Finish it. I don't care what it takes. I don't care what you have to do. Finish the shelter. And so it was a beautiful um, blessing for me because I've learned from politics that if you don't have your wife on your side, you will lose the campaign. And this is a campaign. And, and to try to pull the world and fight the world and fight her too, I don't have that much strength. And so to have her on my side and pushing, because she's a wonderful heart. She was looking out for me. Yeah. You know, she was trying to be practical. Um, but it was a blessing, and it opened the door for us to succeed. So how did you f ultimately wind up funding the shelter? Well, um, a few things happened. I, I remember I went down. I'm always, like, going to utility closets and praying. It's like, I need help. I need help on this. And, and it hit me. 
forget the rest of the building, focus where the children are. And I, so I went out to the construction work and said, stop everything. Everything goes on here. Get it ready. And as soon as we got kids in, we finished that up. As soon as we got kids in, all of a sudden, the community was interested. All of a sudden, I was like, wait, these are real children. There are people in that building. And all of a sudden, the donations start coming in. And then I had a, a wonderful um, person. I don't know if you'd want me to say his name. He's, he's now an elder in the LDS church. He wasn't at the time. He came through, and I was so lucky to get him. And he came through, and he goes, well, how are you funding this? You know, me. He goes, you're paying for this. I go, yeah. He goes, no one, celebrities never pay for their own charities. They have charity balls and things. And I go, no, it's been pretty much my money. He goes, okay. And, you know, I'm going to say his name because I just love him, Bob Gay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I just love Bob. <laughs> and, and, he, and he just, he was quiet. And he's like, okay, and went away. And the next, um, the next day I get a phone call from his office back in Boston and said, Mr. Evans, we want, you know, Mr. Gay has approved a donation of a million dollars to start. Whoa. And um, he has been such a resource. And he got us over that time when we could have failed. So I love that man dearly. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm going to make him mad by <laughs> saying his name, because he's never looked for credit. Yeah. But I, I adore him. And his wife, Lynette, I just adore them. You're on a mission, aren't you? Yes. If you, ha if you could describe that mission in words, how would you describe it? I want people to know that God loves them. That's it. That's, a, that's the basis of every book. Every book of mine is about God. The Michael Vay is about God. Everything is about God. You're Michael Vay, aren't you? Yeah. Tourette syndrome. <laughs> yeah. In today's world, we've become more aware of the differences in people's lives. You grew up with Tourette syndrome and ADD and suffered greatly growing up, but now here you are, a very successful, best-selling author, New York Times, USA Today, prolific and, and world-renowned in your writing. Do you see us as people on this planet becoming more or less tolerant of our differences? Both. Both. Um, in one of my books, I, I put the quote, um, society's never become more tolerant. It's just, it just um, changes targets. And so we, we have become incredibly less tolerant of some uh, populations and communities and um, more tolerant of others. I think kids are actually more tolerant, um, when I go to schools, though, of d disabilities, which is, which is really great. You know, because it used to be a time that they would, you know, tease you about it. I grew up, they would tease me. I remember sitting there in the library, and I was blinking. I had, I would blink a lot. And I remember a guy shouting, he blinks like a horse. And it was really quiet in the whole library. And every turn, and I'm just so ashamed, you know. And mm. that, I don't think that would happen today. You know, the kids actually see people with disabilities, and they relate to them. So I think that's why Michael Vay is so successful, because Michael has a disability. And, um, and the kids, I mean, I have kids with autism come to all my signings. I have kids who are struggling with different things, dyslexia and, and Tourette's, and I think they see in him a hero that they can be. People who drive on I-15 see the billboard every single day. I see it driving into work every single day, Tribe of Kings. That's your baby. That's my baby. Explain to us what that is and why you felt it necessary to organize it. It's a men's fraternity, and it's, it's uh, not a cult, it's not a religion. Um, it started when I went to a man's camp up in Idaho, and I had this, it was amazing, when I went to the room, there's 14 men from different cities around America, and it, for, it was really tense at first, I thought, men don't do this well, you know, they don't sit around and powwow well, and, and I learned something in three days, I, I learned, yeah, first of all, that half the men in the room, more than half, had either attempted suicide or were currently planning their suicide, they were in pain. Uh, the second thing I learned is that none of them had friends except for one. And that included me. I had no male friends. And this is really common, extremely common. And so um, I, I came back and I was really bothered by this. And I thought of how isolated men have become and how society has isolated them and pitted them against each other. And at a time when we need men's groups more than ever, they're all diminishing. And so I was laying in bed one night and I heard a little voice that said, save my sons. 
And you know, you can attribute it to wherever you want, but I mean, that was the same voice I heard with the Christmas box, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, save my sons. I thought, oh, well, heavens no, I do not want to do anything. Like, I don't know how to, I have no idea. I don't even have a male friend. And it just kept coming to me. And it's like, please don't make me do this. <laughs> I'm, not I, yeah, I, I'm at a place where I could start to like, I could go live abroad with my wife or something, right? Yeah. And, um, and enjoy my grandchildren. And, and it just kept coming. So I thought, well, I don't know what to do. So I, I, I called some men I knew and said, do you want to go to dinner? And we went to dinner. That's how it started. And it was line upon line. Uh, things kept coming to me and I kept learning and, and growing in it. Now there's almost, we're approaching 200 men. And, uh, we know of at least 14 suicides that we've that have people have come to me, men have come to me and told me um, that we've uh, stopped, hopefully stopped. We've saved that and, many. And that many men, yeah. Right. And the, the the greater thing is, you walk in the room and there's joy. Um, we have two really strong rules. Um, I, well, actually three. The first is no shaming. If you come in, you have a problem. You walk in and say, "I'm a porn addict." We'll say, "Yeah, we get it. You're, and you're being exploited. How can we help? We love you. How can we help?" The second is there's no bullying, ever. And, and we actually have this guard, right? And it's like, it doesn't happen. We have big Marines, we have an Army Ranger. It's like, you, don't, you just don't do it. It's like you're here to support each other. It would never happen. The third is to be authentic. You get to be yourself, which is easy when those first two rules are followed. Mm. So what has happened is we've built this really fascinating culture where men get to be men again. And when they walk into the room, it's like they immediately feel like they're at home. So I had a psychiatrist who came in, and at the end of the meeting, he goes, I'm looking for the cracks here. How, how are you doing this? I'm waiting to see. It's like, who do you exclude? And he had been in a meeting, and the guy next to me suddenly goes, I'm gay. No one batted an eye. It's like, yeah, OK. And he's out there, and all of a sudden, he just started crying. It's like, and a guy walked up and right around the room and put his arms around him and just held him. It's just like, and he goes, brother, you're one of us, OK? We're, we're all defined in different ways. It means, yeah. it means and, and then the psychiatrist goes, I have a husband. He was afraid to tell, and it's like, you guys didn't flinch. I go, no, this is about acceptance. And someone said, well, are you, is it racist? I mean, all these things come to mind. I go, no, we have three stewards, one of them is black. And in fact, the, first, the founding members, uh, the first six founding members, w one man was black, the other uh, was gay. It's like, no, no, this is, a, our, we're not about exclusion, we're about inclusion. We want anyone. So like when our, our building was burglarized last week, it's like, we would take them in. <laughs> we, it's like, come in the front door. I mean, yeah. Seriously, it's like you don't have to break through a window. Yeah, you don't. We're we'll open. give you a key. We're, we're open. Yeah, we're open. Come on, come on in the building. It's like, and these guys are all willing to help you. And so um, it's really, it's been interesting because it's growing, you know, vertically. More and more men are coming. I have a man flying in from Boise, a prominent doctor who wants to start a tribe up in Boise. We have about five other cities we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. And um, but more important to me is the horizontal growth. And we have men who are just to see them find joy again. Mm -hmm. to see them happy again, they're, and their wives are the biggest fan. I mean, some of them will show up at me and he goes, you know, one guy said last meeting, I had a headache, I wasn't going to come, and my wife said, you've got to go. You're a much better <laughs> husband when you go. And so these men, I mean, these men love women, they respect their wives and their daughters and women in society, they're respectful, they're very protectionist, and a lot of them are being preyed on. Mm. You know, so it's, 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 really, it's really important, and, and it brings a lot of joy. Well, what's a typical meeting like? Well, there's, Tribe of Kings. there's different kinds of meetings. Like um, at the first of the month, we have basically general counsel. Everyone comes together. We talk about individual needs. If someone needs something, talk about how to grow the tribe. Um, and then we have a power message, something to inspire them and lift them up. Um, and we'll get amazing guys that will come in and give this. Um, another meeting is KPN, which is King's Professional Network. And so people come in, they can tell about their businesses, what they do, because we, we do use each other's businesses. We, we support each other and try to help each other succeed. Economically. Yeah. Um, the third meaning is a coronation. And so one of the things that men work for um, is to be kinged. And it's a ritual. It's a really powerful ritual. We need, we have so lost, there are ranks within the, there, the there tribe. Are, not that you would notice. We, yeah, be, yeah, there are ranks. And because we follow the, the um, New Testament adage that he is great among you should be your servant. Right. right, so you would not actually really see that unless they're sitting somewhere. Mm. But um, yeah, in fact, I'm sitting in a meeting. I, I was sitting in, in a meeting. I was talking to some man, and, and he turned to me and goes, "So how long have you been a member?" <laughs> he didn't know who you were. No, and I thought, a while. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was it was great. I mean, it's like I love that. Oh, I love that. That is great. How did we get to the point where adult men need something like Tribe of Kings in their lives? 
they've always needed it. Always. I mean, th there have always been men's groups from Rotary, Elks, Lions, Masons. There's always been. And then all of a sudden, those organizations started kind of coming under attack and started to diminish, and they kind of lost their, their coolness. Hmm. And so there are still two men's groups that are growing in America today. One are, are fraternities, university fraternities. The other are street gangs and hmm. motorcycle gangs. Wow. So it is, it is inbred in us. If they, if they don't get it, they'll grow it somewhere. They'll find it somewhere. They just find themselves alone. Our biggest challenge is isolation, though. That men have gotten this point where it's like, I can stay home and drink or watch porn or, or um, they're isolating themselves. But what they're really doing is they're sedating themselves. They're in pain. And um, you come to our meetings and you hear this laughter. Some of them, one man said, I haven't laughed in three years. Mm -hmm. And you come in there and there's laughter. And it's, it's pretty funny, actually. Mm -hmm. So how do people go about joining? Um, we're, very, we're very open to people who want to join. And uh, as I said, we're completely inclusive. So uh, you can just go online tribeofkings.com. Kings is spelled with a Y, like it used to be, K-Y-N-G-S. Okay. Uh, you could contact any of my sites and put anything out there or, any, or just find a king. Um, most of the growth is happening right now because of kings are running out and telling their friends. What about uh, Tribe of Queens? Uh, we have uh, do, do, do you let women join kings or, or is no. there a separate organization? No, it's a separate that? organization and we have such wonderful women. Uh, we love having the women involved. And, uh, but the men need their alone space. Yeah. They really need that. And, um, but we have women who come and support things. And, um, and as I said, the wives, my wife likes to do a lot of things with the queens because she, she loves the group and the people. And so that's, that's where we are with that. Eventually, we will have a, an actual organization for that. You recently were uh, featured in a prominent article in the newspaper about hugging people and, and touch and that kind of thing. And anybody who has been to your signings knows that a hug is, I mean, they seek it from you. And nine times out of ten, that's how that goes. But there's always one person who winds up, you going, I thought you wanted a hug, and, and there's some kind of miscommunication or misinterpretation. How did we get to that point where a simple hug between adults becomes something questionable in society? Well, first of all, there's, there has been abuse, and there has been women who have been hurt. And as a man, I'm very protectionist. And so, um, you know, some of the things we see with the Me Too movement and Time's Up, and some of this is, is so needed in society. It's important that women are protected. I have four daughters. You know, it's like, you don't mess with my daughters. Okay, that's that, and I'm so, I'm glad to see that sign. What happens is you have people who try to, uh, try to climb anything for their own attention. Mm -hmm. And so we, we live in a, a culture where they, we prayed victimhood. And so um, I don't, go around randomly hugging people, that'd be very awkward. Mm. And so um, I ask, I go, can I give you a hug? Um, I'm more physical, and I did. I did exactly what the article said. I kissed a woman on the cheek. It's like, this was something we did in church for two years, 20, 30 times a day in Italy. Yeah. And it's like, it's just happened, but I do it with my friends here. I do it with my friends back east. In Utah, they're a little bit stiff about that. Mm. I did it. Um, won't do it again. I mean, it's like, it, it obviously caused a problem with this woman. Um, and, you know, but I'm sorry that it, that it hurt her. I, you know, I actually, when I first started, um, I remember I was at a signing and I was just brand new and no one would come. And a man came up to me and he hugged me. Now at the time, men were never hugging, right? It could have been really weird. And, and um, it, it was Jack Canfield who wrote Chicken Soup for the Soul. Oh. And for years, it's like, it was a highlight. It's like, wow, this man reached out to me, and here he's like so big, and I'm nobody, and he reached out to me. It meant so much to me. So um, in this incident, that's what I was doing. There's never been, you know, I know you don't touch where a swimming suit covers, right? Right, I, right, like, right, right. And I hated being the article next to the Sandy um, police chief who was accused of touching thighs and breasts. It's like, yeah. no, no, these, yeah. are, these are compassionate hugs. Most of, the, most of the people I hug, first of all, they ask. Um, they're usually older ladies, usually, sometimes with a cane. Sometimes I have to get down their wheelchair, and, and that's usually um, how it works. Or if they start crying, I will ask, and would you, can I hug you? you know? Because my books are very emotional, and there's this connection on a real level. But um, this is the problem, is that there are people blurring the line between what is legitimate uh, sexual abuse 
and sexual assault or sexual harassment, trying to get something using your power, and then just simple touch. Now, it may, be, it may have been uncomfortable, but we live in a time when it's like, I can find anything uncomfortable. I can be offended by anything I want to be. Well, and, we and, tend and to so, be so isolated that any kind of touch yeah. can be interpreted yeah. that way so I look at anyone. So I look at it, it's like, well, maybe this woman had something happen to her. I remember um, when I was younger in church, um, a teacher went around and he put his hand on the shoulder of a gal who was in, in, in one of the Sunday school classes and uh, completely melted down. She just melted down. Well, it turned out she been, was being sexually abused and that touch. Yeah, you don't know what someone's going through. So you do need to be careful and you need to be really considerate. And had I known that was uncomfortable, I never would have done it. I thought I was, I was doing something nice. And, I, and someone said, well, he, he, he said something. I mean, I don't flirt. I don't need to flirt. My problem is the opposite. <laughs> I mean, it, it's like I'm trying to, I, I said to her, I go, um, I said, well, you just, you're the same age as my daughter. I go, you're pretty like my daughter. That's not going to hurt. I said that. Well, yeah. I like to be told I'm handsome. I mean, I, apparently that's, that is something that could be misread. And, but if you're looking for it, you're going to see it. Uh. So, yeah, I, I, I think we have to look at both sides. We have to make sure where legitimate harm is being done that it is stopped and listen to these women who are being hurt. But there are people who want to get attention out of it and take it too far and to say, uh, my wife said, well, you just can't ever touch anyone again. I go, why be human? I go, some of these people really need it. I had at least yeah. 20 women at my last weekend say, say, I'm not leaving here without a hug. Mm. <laughs> it's like, it's just a reality. <laughs> Has part of, us, part of us on the inside died because of the fact that we can't really touch each other anymore in some context. Yes, yes, and actually this has a lot to do with my books. I remember my first book hit it big. The number one book in America was Howard Stern's Private Parts. Oh. And all of a sudden, Christmas Box trumps it. I get a phone call from USA Today. I just coincidentally happened to be at a celebratory party at Simon & Schuster in New York. And the publicist walks in and says, guess what? Your book's the number one book in the country. You know, it was, it was really exciting. It was perfect timing. But um, so I get a call from a reporter from USA Today, and she said, I just want to tell you something about your career. I've been doing this a long time. You're going to find people who absolutely hate you and will hate you, and you're going to find people who love you. So just accept that. I go, why would anyone hate this? She goes, because you're writing about things that make people feel, and they just... They don't want that. Mm. He goes, but then you have your, but for some people, it's like, it's so good to feel anything these days. Mm -hmm. So that was a, my first kind of brush with that from New York. So my books are about that connection. And that's their, I hear from people and they say, they, you know, they're surprised. Like I get, I get stacks of mail um, from prison, prisons every week. And it's mostly from my walk series. But the man's like, wow, someone gets me. I'm walking with this man. I'm, I'm together. We're in the same mindset. And so the books have to be very, very personal. Mm. What is next for you? I mean, you, you've got the Christmas box house, and you've got Tribe of Kings, you've got all of the writing that you're doing. What is your next big challenge, hurdle, goal? I'm still trying to get a movie for Michael Vey. Um, the Tribe of Kings is what I'm most passionate about, and that takes most of my time. It costs me a lot of money. <laughs> I, just, I, I make money and feed it into that, and so we're still losing money every month. Um, that's probably the biggest thing because my goal is very big to have a million men and uh, to have a million men organization you could actually change the world so I think that's what I'm supposed to do so that that's 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 big enough for me um, if it wasn't I would love to do, move down to my ranch and spend as much time as I can um, and I have two grandchildren who I adore how, how soon do you think a million men will be coming into tribe of kings well, uh, the current rate would take us three years, the current rate of growth. From right now? From right now. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, that's so, that's so pie in the sky. But, I, I mean, I, I'm used to having these, like, really huge dreams. When I started my first book, The Christmas Box, here it is, a little local self-published book. And I went out and I bought these diamond bracelets. Um, not diamond. No, I didn't have them. <laughs> but they were, like, they, they, yeah, yeah. They, but they were actually gold, little gold bracelets like, okay. on the cheap. And I gave it to my staff, the people working together, I said, we're going to wear this until I have the number one book in the country. Well, that's kind of an insane goal. I mean, no one sits around. You're, dealing, you're fighting against billion-dollar 
publishing companies and the whole powers that be. And so for a little guy in Salt Lake City who's never written before, to say my book's going to be number one was insane. But something told me it was going to be big. And I was, I was just naive enough to believe it. And so um, there's a picture of me in Time Magazine. I took my um, gold bracelet, put it right here, and I showed it to my people. So I'm, I'm sitting here like this, and you can see the gold bracelet. It's like we're getting there. In fact, I think at that point we had hit it, number one. And I was like, okay, let's get number one in the world. The sad thing is, as soon as it was over, as it was all over and I hit number one, I came home, I lost the bracelet. Oh, no. I looked down and it was gone. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I guess it served its need, but it's like sentimentally I wanted that. Oh, wow. Well, Richard Paul Evans, number one New York Times and USA Today best-selling author, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. My pleasure. Thank you.